Right. Is that is that five? It feels like five. It feels <laughs> something like that. Yes, it feels like five. <laughs> At least hey. five. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another more. Office Hours, Office 365 Hours, Microsoft Office 365 Hours. Uh, my name is Christian Buckley. Uh, I'm joined here this evening by uh, Sean McDonough, Mike Nelson, Hal Hostetler, Stacey Deerstroll, and Eric Overfield. And so we've got a great uh, one hour program for you. Uh, this is. I'll our, let them be the judge of that. Well, oh. that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a program for you, uh, and then uh, yeah. Okay. So please, if if you'd like to join in, if you have questions, we're going to do our best to monitor uh, the the live feed that's going on over on LinkedIn. Um, so you can go and find the live the live feed. Of course, we're simulcasting in multiple locations: YouTube, Twitter, via Periscope, and over on Facebook. Uh, but uh, if you have questions and want us to respond to them, then we are monitoring actively what's happening out of LinkedIn. You can go out to LinkedIn, search for AvPoint, and on the page, you should find the, the live stream going. So uh, with that, hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. And we are, this is the, uh, so the second episode of the day. So we're here every Wednesday at uh, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific. And so we're doing, this is our APAC, so Asia Pacific region. Uh, and so we'll have some different guest uh, uh, members of the panel over time. Uh, so we had uh, Lorian who is going to be here, but then backed out, just so rude, so incredibly rude. Now, uh, Lorian had uh, other stuff going on, but he'll be here next week. Uh, and so with is that- being, Is this being translated for our APAC friends? I mean- Into English, uh, yes. Okay, so we're <laughs> in our, our, yeah. our mouths are moving, but the the words are coming out. Okay, and just checking. That's right. <laughs> hey, so uh, what I want to do first is is talk about uh, some of the community events that are coming up, and and the plan here, the structure for this show, we're going to go through and talk about community events. We have a a, a topic that we're going to discuss, so uh, for about ten minutes, and then we're going to jump into the community questions that have been posted. We've pulled from like the Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams communities on Facebook, from Microsoft Tech Community, and any questions that get posted directly to us at a LinkedIn. Uh, so with that, we've got a few things coming up uh, around community events. Uh, one of the things that's not on this list, but I just mentioned for those that anybody that is a Microsoft partner, you have the IAMCP event. So if you go to IAMCP.org and you can find out information about this, there's actually a joint 
uh, two-day virtual event happening with IMCP and Microsoft, where they're sharing kind of partner news and information and training information. Uh, and IMCP, for those that don't know, it's the International Association of Microsoft Channel Partners. Um, but uh, there's also a bunch of stuff that's out on the Microsoft Tech Community calendar. So if you go out to techcommunity.microsoft.com, one of them that's coming up uh, is actually tomorrow is the Cloud Security and Compliance Series CS2 virtual conference. Uh, and so you can find that information out on techcommunity.microsoft.com and go to the event calendar and you'll be able to see that series. It's primarily for people in uh, federal, state, and local government. Uh, so they'll be talking about some of the, what's uh, the capabilities around security and compliance uh, on the GCC. Um, but that's interesting for that crowd. We also have um, next week, the Global Excel Summit 2021. If you just can't get enough of Excel, yeah, and that's on. the event. Um, so happy February 6th through 9th. What do you guys just do a whole day of Excel? I mean, that's right. Um, go take a look at that. It's uh, just go to globalexcelsummit.com, all one word. Um, we also have some stuff that's coming up with Global Con 5. Has everybody participated, spoken at one of the Global Cons? Yeah, uh, Global Agile. Of them. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on. Well, they have uh, next Tuesday, February 9th, they have their Turbo Tuesday. So it's kind of in the run up to the main event. Uh, and so the, that is a, a series of shorter how-to sessions. Uh, so that's the ninth, uh, and you can find information if you go to GlobalCon5, and you'll be able to find that that link. Um, I thought it was Taco to, Tuesday. <laughs> that's that's something slightly different, but, but yes, but it is. Um, they also have on the tenth, they have the GlobalCon5 Dynamics Day. So if you're interested in Dynamics 365, that's happening all day Wednesday. Uh, and then the main event, Global Con 5, is happening March 2nd and 3rd. And you can find out all of this information about these events at portal.collab365.community. Just rolls off the tongue. Mm -hmm. Or do a search for Global, Global Con 5. Mm -hmm. uh, community is a top-level domain? Well, yep. it is for their event. Because of all the, the, the SEO stuff that they do, it, it shows up at the top. So, yeah. So, uh, Christian... Yeah. One thing. So Turbo Tuesday was last week because I did two sessions on February 9th is when Dynamics Day 1 starts. Did I get that wrong? Ah, it's Taco Tuesday. I, told uh, you I first spoke time. at it, so oh. unless I spoke really early to a lot. Yeah, large. it's well, <laughs> it, it says February 9th. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm, it, yeah, I'm on the site. I'm on this. Yeah, February 9th I, Dynamics 365 days. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah, and then main event is March 16th. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So I'm pulling stuff off. Of, maybe I pulled from the. Uh, I don't pull off the mind. community calendar, but yeah. Okay. So March know, 16th. If, yeah. If you go to day six on there, January six, uh, 26th was Turbo Tuesday. Okay. So well, my apologies. Wow. The, the reason I, I I even noticed that because if you said that the the main event was March. What did you say? The beginning of March? Mm -hmm. Second, uh, March 16th. Well, guess what? The second through the, that's Ignite. So if you don't yeah. know that, that's actually the start of Microsoft Ignite, which is open yeah. for registration right now, that would be, by the yes, way. It is. That, that, uh, you know, that is on my list as well. Okay. So, so, I, so I'm, I went and pulled those dates from the tech community calendar. So either something is grossly outdated or in there wrong or whatever, but Apologies. That's why you need to do your homework, people. You can't believe everything that you hear. You yeah, know, he, from the he, pundits. He did it. Fake news. I just want. I just wanted to know how I, you know, did this whole going to the future thing and then back. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Do it again. <laughs> I do want to say that uh, if you go out to the spsevents.org uh, site, there are two SharePoint Saturday virtual events okay. coming up. So on February 13th, and I know I got that date right. You have SharePoint Saturday Cairo. And then you have on March 6th, the M365 Saturday Chennai, India. Um, mm -hmm. So you have two events that are coming up. So just additional opportunities to, uh, to hear from a wide variety of community folks. Um, two other things, there's also a Microsoft 365 career fair happening on February 19th. And there's, that's all over social, um, but there's, if you go out to bit.ly, so bit.ly, slash m365 jobs 
you'll find that. So if you're looking for uh, job information in the Microsoft ecosystem, that would be a great uh, event to participate in. And then as everybody said, and and uh, was a little bit early on Mike, but Microsoft Ignite happening my, March 2nd through 4th, and you can register now, it's open. So All we're right. already, just so the audience knows, we are already planning an intervention for Christian. Um, sometimes <laughs> when he does his research, he drinks, and <laughs> he, he just doesn't get you know the, the right data. So we we are going to have a full intervention on air uh, live yeah. for everyone to see. So. Yeah, it's so it's so great to know that everyone cares so much. I don't know about yeah. what, but they care. So we're going to do the exorcism this time, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move to the week to the topic, the weekly hey, topic. Wait, just, you, are you going to include at all the reimagining the employee experience tomorrow? Six That's a.m. Crazy. What is that, Eric? That's a great point. I well, and so yeah, so it's, I mean, tomorrow well, Microsoft's right. made a really big deal of this. Um, Jared Spitar, I think Satya is going to speak at it. I've seen Naomi post a lot about it, which is really fascinating if you think about what she deals with in Microsoft and this whole thing. So anyhow, tomorrow, 6 a.m. Pacific, uh, global free event, about an hour long, I think. It's uh, reimagining the employee experience out of Microsoft. Mary J. Foley wrote a really good post um, on this as well where she's sort of and kind of alluding to what she thinks it's going to be. It's a big event. I think it's worth going to, although 6 a.m. for me is awful, but I'm, I assume it's going to be recorded as well. Yeah, I agreed. It's mm -hmm. uh, some some big announcements. It is worth checking into. Yeah, uh, I think you're so. Going, you're going to see the news hit the wire uh, later in the day tomorrow. So yeah. thanks for bringing that up, Eric. All right, so jumping over to our weekly topic. Sorry, and uh, so topic. another, <laughs> that's right, we need theme music. Thank you, Hal. <laughs> um, that's just something, Debbie. I know Debbie's all, all over it. Well, um, <coughs> but there was the introduction of Work Lab. Everybody, take a look at that. Work no, Lab, I'll the blog. I didn't. No. Wow. No. So it's a new blog. So you go do a search on Microsoft Work Lab and f pull that up. Uh, the, when I read through a couple of the articles, um, you know, they're basically like long form. Uh, articles that are written kind of like a Wired or a Fast Company article that gives you uh, um, more depth around the story around some of the new developments, some of the things that are happening. It's a so it's it's kind of a you know a deeper look into uh, data driven and you know kind of thoughtful dis the discussion around how the nature of work is changing. So. That's that's the kind of the topic here for the next uh, nine minutes around how uh, the nature of work is changing. And obviously, a lot of that is driven by, you know, what's happened this past year. And I think it caught, uh, certainly from a product perspective, um, strategies changed. Priorities of features changed dramatically. Uh, ahead, delivery, delivery schedule changed, sped up, if anything. <laughs> Add this into the context that this was announced late January, so not a few weeks ago or a week ago, right when the Reimagine the Employee Experience was announced as well with some really big names at Microsoft that are going to be presenting. That's interesting. <laughs> I'll leave it at that uh, kind of as a, hmm, maybe you should attend tomorrow to see what's going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's the, the Work Lab blog seems interesting. If you look at their contributors, it's a whole bunch of, um, of the higher ups at Microsoft. Yeah, it, it, and it's uh, again, it's, you're getting some of the story behind like what Microsoft experienced, uh, the the data that showed them. There's a lot of talk about you know the 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 burnout around you know online meetings and workshops. It's not just a matter of doing what we did before, but now online. Um, it, it really requires a, a, a change to the way that we do do the work that we do. And so maybe that just kind of opened that up. What What's changed about the way that you're working? Well, I'll speak up so fast. Um, I'll jump in on this one, which is that my office had already gone remote uh, a year prior, but my clients had not. They still wanted the on-sites. And that has fully changed. And I can tell with everyone that I work with that who has gone, everyone has gone remote, 
there was some pain points for sure, but it's starting to work out. And I think people are, are starting to get into the flow of being able to deal with it. But at the same time, I think a lot of us would like to go back to an office every once in a while, maybe a couple days a week or something like that, because um, it can be a challenge with the kids screaming in the background. So for me, so um, my company's been remote for almost nine years. Um, so it's, you know, that piece was not different. The piece that's so different is I don't have that, oh, hey, I need to go run a couple errands. I'm going to shut down, you know, for lunch and I'm going to go do this or at a certain time because like, oh, I don't really want to do that. I'm just going to have my groceries delivered because, you know, yeah. um, I find that I work a lot more now than I did. And I also find that my clients are working more and they're like pinging me and texting me a lot after five o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that has just become more and more. I mean, uh, throughout this year, it's just been increasing, increasing. Yeah, my situation. Know where to find you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My situation has been, you know, the company that I work with, um, being an independent for so many years and working for other companies. Um, I'm used to working from home. Not a big deal. And uh, what I have found difficult for me um, is since the pandemic, um, I've had a you know, a couple of times I've caught myself having problems focusing. I've never really had that problem before, but it seems like there's something with the pandemic when it started back in March. It's just like it threw me off. And it, because I, now I have family home all the time. Yep. Um, I used to have an empty house every day, um, but now I've got, you know, everyone yeah. and I have my own office, but it's still a little different. Um, but I will say some of the, a lot of the people that I work with um, have never worked from home in their mm -hmm. entire careers. And it, it Helping, trying, trying to help them adjust to that, has been. Um, sometimes it's it's it's. I would say been you know a good experience. It's been really easy, but there are people that have a really difficult time with that adjustment, and they have had a difficult time. And they're like, they're they're basically clawing at the fact that they get to go back into an office and be with people, um, but you know that's not going to happen for a while. So. Yeah, for me, I mean, I've been working remote for a number of years now and, you know, the, the, the shift with COVID and whatnot certainly impacted me just like it has all of you. Um, but the bulk of my interactions haven't really changed on a daily basis. Uh, previously with like uh, critical projects, I would typically go out and meet with customers. Uh, um, I don't do that now. Right. And what I find myself trying to do is find ways to be social in a virtual context, uh, do something that approximates social interaction because we can't meet face to face, many of us, most of us. Um, so the challenge is really how do we interact with one another? How do I reach out and touch Christian? It's <laughs> you really, know what I mean? <laughs> really, actually, my, my. <laughs> My experience is quite a bit different from uh, from, mm. from all of the rest of you from the, from the standpoint how. of where I actually come from, and that's television broadcasting. And my clients are not people. My clients are transmitters and videotape machines when they still existed, transmitters, two-way radios, hard wiring character generators, things like that. And uh, fortunately for me, I'm retired, have been for the last... Uh, coming up on nine years, I still part time and I still have one client. It's a uh, it's a uh, low power television station run by a, <clears throat> a religious broadcast organ organization. It, it, it's a whole rip roar and snort to kilowatt that's fed from a satellite. But if it breaks, I still got to go fix that thing. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the world, the IT world that I do, and I'm consultant in a rodent roll and shore and tower, which is a a managed services provider for uh, that really hasn't changed that much. If anything, it's kind of broadened the horizons because I'm doing more because there were fewer of them there and they need more help with a vast influx of uh, remote from home work that they are now providing for their clients. Well, uh, I just looking at this the schedule here. Really appreciate uh, sharing uh, some of the the experience and insights. I mean, obviously, we can talk for an hour on that topic alone. There's a lot to, to go into. It'll be interesting to see what Microsoft adds to that um, you know, tomorrow with some of their announcements. But uh, again, I would recommend people go take a look at the work lab 
uh, blog. So just look up, do a search for uh, Microsoft Work Lab and, uh, and, and see some of that content, uh, which they'll be adding to on a regular basis. Uh, so it's, uh, it's some really great insights there into uh, you know, what Microsoft is thinking and how they're looking at this uh, as the, this this space because I don't think I think we're the reality is uh, things are changing and uh, I, I don't think this you know there there will ever be a go back to normal I think with some things are are going to change permanently and uh, and I it's not all bad uh, there's a lot of good things about that but uh, it'll I, be interesting I, to see what sticks after we get out of this period what right. actually mm-hmm. has shifted yeah. the new norm. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to uh, some degree of events and other social activities. I think, like everybody Too else, true. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we don't have any homework to cover here. So usually, this segment, if there's something that is left over. Now, having said that, uh, we will have homework next week. I'm pretty confident that we'll uh, we'll not be able to answer all of the questions tonight, uh, but we'll we'll attempt to. Um, All right, so why don't we jump in with question number one. Um, This is one that was asked, um, actually this off this morning's broadcast, uh, Jose asked, uh, what is the difference between Microsoft Teams and SharePoint Online? Um, What is the best use case for each of them? So I'll open the floor. What's the difference between using Teams and SharePoint? Um, I'll start just by asking the question that you're you're not talking apples to apples. You're talking like, uh, you know, potatoes to onions. You're you know, it's or cars. Yeah, <laughs> it, it just it's it's crazy different in terms of what you want to accomplish. I mean, Teams is a collaboration tool. It's a it's an enterprise collaboration tool um, that's main used mainly for um, interpersonal uh, uh, activities. Um, when, you know, meetings and, and uh, uh, being able to do webinars and, and live shows, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it uses SharePoint, or I should say, it uses OneDrive as its back end, which it also uses SharePoint as its back end, too. So um, I would just put that out there that you're not talking about the same thing. And then you really have to look at what you want to get out of it to determine which one you're going to use. So in, uh, in with a lot of the clients and stuff that I, I work with, my huge difference is they're like, when do you use Teams versus when do you not, or when do you use SharePoint? And I go, when I'm at my desk, I'm typically in the site because I'm doing 50 million different things. I've got different tabs open. And, you know, I could be doing a form, a Power BI, you know, that type of stuff. So I'm very driven to the, you know, the actual site format at that point, right? But... Um, so like I deal with a lot of construction companies, schools, all that type of stuff where their people are not in an office and their clients, they're external. And so giving them, um, you know, the access into the information they need without exposing everything to them, you know, it's that great mobile being a remote type of person where they don't have to be, you know, have everything dumped on them. They can really focus on what they're doing inside of teams, very structured inside of there versus all the stuff you can do actually, you know, in the, in the cloud with the M365. So, I personally awesome. still like the inner loop, outer loop, you know, concept, you know, if you, in some of those diagrams, and I know it's a bit outdated, Microsoft is not using that, you know, the visuals around that anymore, but you think of SharePoint as being foundational when you're, sh- you know, sharing, storing content, sharing documents in teams, that is, you know, uh, SharePoint underneath yep. uh, the hood. Um, powering that. Having said that, I mean, it, it It does kind of fit into the it depends uh, response to that. Um, mm-hmm. Like for, for my company, AvPoint, so we have a SharePoint online based intranet. And that is the, the where I go for your HR, for the structure, for the, the content around there. We have our go to market section and where I know I can find all of our you know, the, the, the common presentations, all the templates, all those resources there, as well as what I'm in uh, over in Teams, which are more project-based and more focused and specific. And that's where most of the activity happens. But yep. I'll often be in there researching inside of a team, looking for information. And again, I can see it in SharePoint or it will point me back to the go-to-market site in the intranet. 
Uh, so that's the way we use that. And we also have Yammer. So that is just the social place. So that's where it's needs to go broad to the entire organization. We're sharing things out, general knowledge or asking questions or being social with each other. That is, that is the company, the culture where we're trying to maintain that. SharePoint is where the, uh, you know, the, the structured uh, intranet activities are, and Teams is where that project-based focused activity happens. Uh, so, but when you share a file in Yammer or in Teams, it is SharePoint yep. that you're saving that content to. You said that much better than I did, Christian. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's some important feature yeah. distinctions for sure. Uh, as, as I keep saying, if you have Teams, you have SharePoint because that's right. where all the files are going to be stored. Period. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a no that's going to happen. If you have SharePoint, you might not have Teams, but it's probably a good thing to have. Uh, there's some big feature differences for sure. So around SharePoint, SharePoint's the only place you can create web pages, like news articles and things like that. It's the only place you can really have that navigation of, of, of navigating a website because that's what SharePoint allows you to also do. I think that's an important thing. And if that's what you need, you're going to want to go there. If you're going to be posting news articles and whatnot, you're going to be doing that in SharePoint. Now, you can surface those in Teams for sure uh, if you want. You can surface them in the Yammer and elsewhere. Um, and then if you want to have conversations, meetings, video, all that kind of stuff, that's going to have to happen in Teams. SharePoint used to have a commenting feature. Yeah, that's don't ever, don't. So you're going to do all that in Teams. So threaded conversations, they're going to be there. I argue for almost most organizations I work with, you're going to have both. You're going to use them at both at the same time. Yep. If you're not going to use Teams, you're going to be using something like Slack. But now you're creating a really weird, disjointed um, experience for your edge users. It doesn't make any sense to me. Stick with a connected platform. Yep. Well, uh, question number two. This one is, uh, is uh, typical of some of the questions that we see out in the community. I include them here, uh, you know, so that, uh, and I we read these verbatim from how they're posted. Um, nice lead and, up. And, and so I think we can <laughs> decipher a little bit here. Um, so Michael uh, asks, this says, I have a weird one. It happened a few months ago uh, where this almost sounds like it happened to my cousin. <laughs> um, We're at band camp. I'm one asking, night, yeah. I'm, asking right. for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a weird one. It happened a few months ago where one user appeared twice in my chat list, but it was not a duplicate as the chat content was different. Uh, then it happened again recently with another. I had him pinned and then suddenly he was chatting from another chat window. I can't delete either, but don't know how they appeared. Any thoughts? <laughs> so this is teams. Say what? <laughs> so I must say I have actually seen that. Oh, yes. so, whoa! And um, so the issue came about because there was a conversation going on the Teams app, and then the person got jumped on their phone. They went remote, and they were still tr in that chat, but they had opened Teams on the front. It wasn't already open, and then they opened it, and for some reason they popped up twice. So mm. that when if they actually shut it down, then the the other chat would go away. So that's how essentially result. That's how the issue occurred there. Don't know if that's the same thing here, but it yeah, is, I've like had that same. Eric said it's Teams. <laughs> so. I've had that exact same thing happen. Uh, in fact, if, there, if I, uh, for example, the, the, the Microsoft guest tenant, uh, I'm two different. I have two different logins, and I appear as pretty much the same person in both. How'd you manage that, Hal? Hmm? One's a, get business two and one's a business and one is uh, one is the personal one. Yeah. So, so it's in the Microsoft guest tenant. It's a long story. OK. So follow up See, question. Uh, and Stacy, you might be able to answer this is that you mentioned that when that person hung up or removed that first session, mm -hmm. you said that that chat went away. Mm -hmm. The chat doesn't stay. I mean, so, the person leaves, that chat is still there, right? So the the chat was still there, but it actually starts a new one. So then the it kind of stops from this one, and then the next one, it continues. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, so it was, it was very, very weird. Like, I, you literally yeah. had two conversations going, but it was just because they had jumped from one, the um, you know, the, the desktop app to the mobile app. Breaking huh. the illusion of continuity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It was very when, odd. When I said this is Teams, um, I haven't had this specific experience, but like one that I know not just I've had is like the double ring 
someone's calling me and I get two yeah. ringers and I could answer one in the same in the same I, I device. I love that feature, Eric. I, I do too. <laughs> so uh, it's just it, it's teamed. Like there's just sometimes some weird things. So uh, interesting that that others have, have seen it. Stacey, that's pretty cool, but I have not. I just I just, some of those things I just go oh, teams. I, so yeah. it is a very fluid pro- product right now. Yeah, with Eric, Eric, see, Eric has to understand is we don't take telephony questions. So <laughs> yeah, we consider that if you say ring, we 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 think telephony, well, and then Sean is- Sean freaks out. Sean doesn't want anything to do with it. So no yeah. ablo telephony. Oh, uh, don't rely. But that's, I'm uh, I'm the one that freaks out when my phone rings because someone's calling my teams, but my computer that I'm sitting right in front of does not. I, I just them. love when it rings in both places and you answer one and the other keeps ringing. That, yes. oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's my favorite. That's Although that happened. hasn't happened in a while. That was an older version. That was Skype, not Teams. Oh, no, uh, but it, teams. oh, experienced oh, that a bit with yeah. Teams as well at the beginning. But I haven't experienced that personally in a while. So, so I was on a, a client call and my phone was still ringing. They're like, do you need to get that as someone calling calling you? And I go, it's just you. On my phone. <laughs> just you. Stop I, I don't want to talk to you right now. Let's continue. <laughs> you can really mess with somebody. We have an inception moment happening inside of Teams. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, question number three. Matt uh, asks, is there a way to allow – there's another Teams one, Mike. Get ready. Uh, is there any way to allow no. chat – to be assigned so students can only chat with staff, mm-hmm. teachers, and not among themselves. Yeah. In other words, they can use chat to message teachers directly and vice versa, but can't directly message other students. No. Yeah, nice We've teacher. seen this question before, and Mike, the answer yeah. is no. <laughs> no. <laughs> not be possible. Nice feature, though. It has a user voice that is just like one of the highest rated user voice, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, things that people want. Um, no, can't, can't do it. Sorry. For, for people that aren't familiar with user voice, yeah. what is this thing of which you speak? <laughs> uh, well, let me tell you, Christian. Um, <laughs> it, it's actually a platform that Microsoft uses, which they said was going to go away a few years ago, but it never did. It actually is still there are too alive. many user voice requests to keep yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It's it was supposed to go away. But well, uh, another inception moment, Christian. Don't yeah, do that's right. That's it's right. like it's like um, it, it's like the Roadrunner, you know, um, where pulling up the, the the his own pants keeps him from dropping off the cliff. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow, that went off the left field. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. anyway. yeah. Um, so focus, Christian. Focus, right here, right here. Okay. Um, so. User voice, uh, and I don't even know what the URL is. Is it uh, Microsoft.UserVoice.com? I don't no, remember. Just but Google it. Microsoft yeah. Teams user voice. Okay, but way. yeah, and and Eric is right for the team side of things, but also, I mean, any yeah, I shouldn't say sure any, but a lot of Microsoft products. Um, some of the product teams have pulled that, you know, pulled away from user voice, um, and they're using GitHub repos now to issues and discussions inside of GitHub repos. Uh, for theirs, and they're yeah. they're pulling away from user voice. So, uh, but if you go out to user voice, and you you know you can see a whole bunch of different Microsoft topics uh, out there. Yeah, I think the more business focused, uh, productivity focused, collaboration focused solutions are all out there. So yeah, just go search user voice, uh, you know, the Pro- SharePoint or Teams, and you'll be able to find that. But you can then go in there and always you know, and search. If you have a feature, a uh, report, uh, you know, uh, some kind of capability that that you need or would like to see or have a, a brilliant idea, um, go and do a search first because you'll see probably dozens, if not hundreds or thousands that also had that brilliant idea, but then you can vote it up. And yeah. what most people don't realize is it only takes like five, 10 votes for Microsoft to formally re- uh, respond. So if you don't, in your research, if you don't find that thing that you really want out on user voice, add it in there as a new item, send it around to your coworkers, to your yep. friends and family, yeah. get them to log in, vote up on it, and it will prompt a, uh, makes me think of Blade Runner. So it's designed to provoke an, uh, a, a response. What is it? A, an emotional Boy, response. Yeah. So the other thing, when you're searching, 
when you're searching is search it, search what you're looking for a couple different ways because depending on wording, so yeah. So you wanna get the biggest benefit out of it. So search a couple different ways before you submit. Right, yeah. Yeah, because there are duplicates and they will combine, um, but just save yourself some uh, some some time lost there yeah. and do a little bit of research. Yeah. I have a love-hate relationship with, with user voice for sure. Um, I mean, there's some of those top rated items that have been there for three years. Oh, sure. Microsoft sure. replies and says, we're working on it. It's being yeah. deployed. They, they, they say yeah. it a year ago with no yeah. updates. Yeah. So my experience with the engineering teams that I've been able, fortunately, to work with is they, they do read it. Like this, they actually are looking at this. They're looking at it uh, routinely. They are seeing what, what, what people are voting on. The votes do matter. So as Christian said, you got to get people to vote. If it's just a few, they aren't putting in any cycles because Microsoft only has so much time. And we all know that Microsoft is very metric driven. So it makes sense. They're going to look for the votes. And just because you're voting for it doesn't mean they're going to do it. But they do seem to reply to at least the top yep. 10. Well, and some of them are like, nope, we're not doing it. Like, just stop. We're not going to do that. And there's two other places to go and look as well. I mean, so user voice is a good first stop. You, should, yeah, you could also, especially if something that's been out there, that's a great example, something that's been there for a while, my next step would be to go and look at the roadmap site and yep. see yeah. if there's something that's open and the status that's out there, where that is. If it doesn't appear there, the third location would be over on the tech community. Tech community, uh, yeah. And, and look and see if there's discussion because there's usually corresponding discussions in tech community uh, yep. in relation to user voice. Yep. And so see, and you can sometimes in different, look, they're, we're all human. They're, they're all human. Uh, they have limited time and resources. Some yep. are a little more active in one or more locations, but if you cover all three of those, then you can generally find something. If it's missing from all three locations, then it's either your search criteria is wrong, uh, or uh, or it's it's new and enter it and start the discussion. Yeah, and I've also seen that where there's those uh, uh, items that are way voted, highly voted, people really want them, but it's asking for an architectural change at the root of the platform and the way that Microsoft is split up. Teams, SharePoint, those all include many teams across many organizations across many different cvps so it's very it's not always easy to just go ahead and say oh hey we want private channels that takes a lot of work to add that's why it took microsoft so many years to do well look so, at the, uh, look be, at be the org, with, org switch well, yeah look at the org look, your org switch oh, your org yeah. switch had to go through like 20 20 different yeah, pms exactly uh, you know that was crazy so uh, again they're, they're they're filled with humans and uh, that's an yeah. active part of change management as well as where those priorities are and who the team members are. I wish Microsoft was a little more transparent on some of the stuff. Sometimes they try to be, sometimes there's purpose or reason why they're not. Uh, but based on my experience, they do care. If you actually got to talk to the engineers on it, they understand, they're hearing, they're seeing it, they know, they might just not be allowed to share it, so. Right, yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, we've got sort of a, uh, a related question as far as like change management. Um, question number four, uh, Gupta says, uh, Microsoft releases beta features to target release users in a tenant. These users can see new features before they are released to an entire tenant of users. Yeah. Similarly, can we implement the concept of target release for a custom power app? Um, Tap into Microsoft's mm -hmm. system? Uh, no, I, I, I don't know that that's what the question is. That's one way to interpret that. The other way to interpret that is yes, you can, but you would be a different branch of your Power App. Okay. So if you were to, add, well, it depends on if you integrate, you know, uh, Azure DevOps with your Power App, because you could just create another branch and you could have that branch given to other people, like, kind of like a, a whole DevOps cycle um, where you allow people to see the, the pre-release, use it, test it and everything, then it comes back around in the DevOps cycle. You could do the same thing with a Power App. Um, okay. It's not functionality that's built into that I'm aware of built into Power Apps, but if you use that type of methodology or use Azure DevOps, then yes. Can can doesn't the portal kind of help with that a little bit? I don't know that. I, I I just I'm speaking from mainly just the Power Apps, the creation of an application. I know I know two of the developers that that I worked with um, on 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 Power Apps, and they actually. Uh, came from a DevOps environment, so they implemented DevOps just to create those power apps. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, that's just part of the cycle. That's like QA testing, all that kind of stuff. If there is something in the portal, I don't know that. But 
Yeah, because I just know that in the portal you can create essentially different uh, different areas. So like a dev area, and then people can test, and then I think then you can you yeah. know go live with it in different. So I think that kind of kind of helps with that if that's where the question is leading, or if it's leading down the path that Sean went. <laughs> you know, so possibly could help. I walk a lonely path. <laughs> Gonna break into song right now, Sean, or are you? Uh... Christian, you're frozen on my screen. Okay, I, I thought it was just me. I didn't want to. Yeah, no. All right, Debbie, I'm gonna turn off and on the camera. That's a, you're gonna. No. I got the message saying that was something was wrong. I was hoping it wasn't the case, but I'm gonna try turning it off and on again. Reboot. He crossed I the streams. <laughs> He's returned. No video. His presence, anyway. Is it back? No. No. All right, I'm going to jump no. in. While we're trying to figure that out, I'm going to ask the next question and let you guys take sure. it. Uh, so Pam asked a question. Is there any way to tell who created a list or library on, in a SharePoint site? I'm looking through the settings, and I can't find anywhere where it shows who created what. The like UI does question. not have that. Uh, you got to be, I, I think at PowerShell you must, but the UI, I've never seen that in the UI. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a really good question. I, I would think in PowerShell you could, but I could, I, I actually don't know. Why wouldn't that be a column uh, in, in the UI where you can bring up the created by? I mean, that's got to be tracked and I don't know why you couldn't create that as a column. A custom well, list. It, no, it's so if you have a list that lists lists. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> a list that oh, lists but, lists. Where lists are list items themselves, that are would we be a different to list story. Stuff live? <laughs> Let me look. <laughs> um, I just I know I haven't seen it in the UI, but I don't know enough about the met back end metadata of a list itself, like the, in the list settings. I just I would think there's there's so many created by kind of things that. I, it's got to be there. I just, um, I've never seen the UI. Strangely enough, this kind of relates to uh, in, in Azure, in, you cannot find out who created an object in Azure unless you look at the raw data or you look at the log data, mm -hmm. the activity log data. Yep. There's no column that says created by. There's no way to just look at a resource object and be able to find out who did it. So to me, that just it doesn't make a lot of sense. But. I'm actually uh, I'm looking down the server object model just to see if it supports the notion of an owner. And? And I'm not seeing anything. Wow. Hmm. That's sad. It yeah. is. It is. It, it's sort of weird. I, I'm really shocked by that. Uh, to me, the quick answer to the question is no, sorry. Like The UI definitely doesn't have it. I've never seen it. Uh, Sean, you're definitely confirming that it doesn't even look like it's there, which is just surprising. Yeah, I don't see it either. I think you have to fall back to like logs. Mm. That's a great question, though. <laughs> That's a really good question. How did we exist this long without that? Yeah. Surprised no one's asked that before. I mean, I guess you can narrow it down by the people that have the access to do so, but beyond that. <laughs> well, it's always been a, a, an issue where you want to find out who created an object for many different reasons, right? They created it. And it wasn't supposed to be created. Um, they created it, and it's you know uh, not uh, you know politically correct, or it's not part of company policy. So you got to get it deleted, and you want to know who actually did it. Um, you know things like that. So well, yeah. And if the person no longer works at the company, you don't exactly have them to reach out to and say why. Yeah. 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 SP list does not have yeah an owner of any sort. Uh, so I, I Googled it. Uh, it looks like there's something about the um, author and created in PowerShell. So yeah, creator would be what you'd want. And that uh, you have there to go an author. to API, yeah. I think the author is gonna be your creator. So you're gonna have to use PowerShell, potentially PNP PowerShell might help make, make it a little easier. I don't know, I'm gonna keep looking. <laughs> author makes sense. I guess I should use, uh, I should think in terms of synonyms. I'm sorry, my vocabulary is just not broad enough to cover the question. 
Well, we could, if you find something, we could come back to that one. Or we could yeah. leave it for Eric to have some homework. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. I'm go. working on it. Okay, come so back to it. I got 15 minutes. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah With no the worries. author property, yeah, that, on SP list, that looks... So I'll flag it for Eric homework, but if we come back to it you know, tonight while we're still live here, in the next 15 minutes... Um, but, uh, yeah, we can address that, but, uh, it's weird looking at a circle that just says CB. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So unfortunately, so I'm going to kick off this question. I'm going to have to exit teams and re-enter. There's a problem with video with my video feed. So something's not coming through, but so let me kick off the question here and let you guys take it and I'll uh, be right back. Um, so here's a question from Martin. So number six, uh, have a user that every time she opens a file in word or Excel, uh, from Office 365, she gets in protected view uh, or the document is locked. So the PC is on Windows 10 and Office 365, but she then opens the same file from a different PC, also Windows 10, but with Office 2013, she can then open the same document without a problem. Uh, we we re created a replica of her account and she had no issue opening the same file. We reinstalled her PC and then it works, but only for like a minute or so, and then the problem comes back, getting locked out. The problem is both in IE and Chrome Edge. We use Office 365 and have local AD that syncs to Office 365. The account seems fine. She has no other issues that we have seen, only with SharePoint files. I have myself no issue to edit or check out, check in the same file. Does anyone have any idea or that had experienced the same or similar problem? So I have done something very similar, luckily in a dev environment, but someone should go see if someone has been playing with a policy. So like labels and security, um, because you, you know, you can create labels and you can set policies and stuff on, you know, you know, that it has to go through a scan first or whatever. And there's certain settings in there that um, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you can, you can literally lock files from um, the office 365, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Word, Excel, and all those kinds of things. So um, in, a, in a test in, in my dev environment, I literally could not edit any files. And I go and I remove it, and then I was fine. So it's definitely something to look at. If that's the issue, I'm not sure. But I experienced something similar because of that type of stuff. Another thing yeah, worth checking out is the temporary files area where files get checked out. Uh, if any permission changes have happened uh, in that area, that the user has lost uh, privileges, um, that would affect the ability to uh, interact with those documents as well. Yeah, I, I, I question I question the because they said they reinstalled, it worked and then it didn't work. So it worked for a little bit uh, and then it stopped working again. So I don't know if it's a cache issue, um, you know, the office cache, um, mm -hmm. but. It almost seems to me, and without having all of the information, could it be an information rights management issue? Uh, it could be an IRM issue that's, you know, like Stacy had mentioned, somebody had applied a policy. Well, maybe there's an IRM yeah. mm -hmm. that's uh, a global policy um, across, you know, everything that's in OneDrive, I mean, i.e. SharePoint OneDrive. Um, and are they actually pulling these from a SharePoint site or are they bringing them directly in from OneDrive? I don't know. Are they, they using a SharePoint URL? I mean, is it is it a service inside of the Office app where you bring up the you know the actual SharePoint site, or how are they pulling that file? How is she opening that file? That's a good question. That's yeah. a great question. Yeah, there's a lot more information that's needed to properly troubleshoot that, but it's definitely it's something in that realm. It sounds like to me, but totally could be the temporary file thing. But with a rebuild, wouldn't it? I mean, when they went to go reset it up, you would have thought that they would have gotten a an access denied somewhere else before, you know, on that. So it until the policies got shoved down, and, and you know, they got yeah. brought down. Once the rebuild was over, she logged in. She logged into Office, uh, yep. and then and boom, policies took effect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yep. I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you on that. Okay. Well, I'm still having video issues here for some reason. I don't know what's happening here. Uh, we're going to try something else, but I'll jump to the next question. Sean, I think Sean has a picture of you. You can just hold it up Sean, <laughs> right next to you. That's right. Can you do that? 
That's right. And then it'll look like Christian it's, is on. It's the photo in your, it's in the locket around your there neck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably what There we go. There you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, so we have that, uh, that, that issue. Uh, let's see. Number seven. Uh, Heloisa uh, says, I want to create a lookup column for my list. Then I realize I can't look up a list in another site. Is there a way to look up a list on another site? If no, how do I duplicate a copy of the list with complete content from one site to another? Those are two different questions. Yes, I was going to say. And the... You only get one question. <laughs> well, the answer to the first question is, you're right. You can't look up to a, a, a list that is outside. Um, how do you duplicate? Uh, well, you've got any number of different ways. I, you know, ShareGate makes a great tool to move lists around. Um, you've. Are we talking on-prem? Because you can, you know, if we're talking on prem, well, you've got access to the export import API. Uh, the content migration API is a great way to get a list out. But um, if the list exists in two places, couldn't like if a file lands in the one, a flow kick off and copy it to the other? So it's automated? Sure. With either, a, you know, a flow or an event receiver of some yeah. sort. Keeps them in sync, but you're duplicating data, right? Right. Yeah, we're not weighing in on the just because you can, should you? It's, right. Yes. Yes. So we we got people dropping here like flies. Uh, we lost Eric's cam. We lost Hal's cam. Um, Christian's back again. He's on mute, but he's back. You lost me. I'm, I'm here. I'm seeing. I'm, I'm seeing Christian. I see everybody. I see everybody. Yeah, My everyone's here, Mike. Mike so sounds like a personal problem. problem. <laughs> All right, uh, let's jump. Let's let's go to, to question number eight. Uh, Jennifer asks, uh, "Is there any way to create a new list using the Microsoft List app and have my existing SharePoint online library feed my library items to the list created with the List app on an ongoing basis?" I'm looking for a simple way to track document status as it goes through the approval process. Now that our SharePoint designer and out of the box workflow have been discontinued. So create a new list in the list app. Bueller, Bueller. Have the existing SharePoint library feed my library items to the list created with the list app. Bueller. I'll admit <laughs> I haven't used the list app yet. So I have to import, uh, you know, create new list with an import from an Excel docs and whatnot. Um. I thought there was, I thought there was like a, you know, I don't want to use the the term of Fab Forty esque. Uh, Fab oh, somebody no. created wow. that for a content approval, um, like a content approval list. I thought there was a template for that. I've not gone and created one for it. There's an app for that. The, yeah. So. Hmm. I have ideas, but I don't know uh, if they would actually work. I, I would totally want to try we, that. We could share ideas. What's so the idea? Is this where the disclaimer we're supposed to be putting on the screen right now? <laughs> Correct. Yeah, yes. we're. I know. <laughs> you know, without oh. that disclaimer, we're, we're, we're in dangerous territory. Mike. We keep referring for those that, that, you know, the disclaimer we're talking about, we had in another version of the, the office hours where we, we said that, uh, you know, you, you, you get what you pay for here. <laughs> sometimes we're doing our best to go through and troubleshoot something, but, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're solving problems in real time. <laughs> we don't just know all the answers, but we figure it out. And we're going to swag. <laughs> yeah. Swag. That's right. Mm. Hmm. So, so no, we don't know the answer to that. You're going to share your theory, Stacy. Somebody's got homework. I know. It sounds like Stacy has a theory. I wonder if she needs to do some homework to find out if the theory will stick. 
<laughs> okay, okay. All right, <laughs> Stacy, homework. Excellent. But I mean, if you're trying to track documents, data, that's a great thing for a flow. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Like, if they if they create the list and then tie the flow to it, right? Then they could track the track the status from there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll do some homework and yeah. Well, that and that scenario is fairly common. So right. um, yeah, yeah, I, I think you're going to find something else that's out there. So we'll we'll come back and address that. Uh, all right, uh, question number nine. Uh, we've got four more minutes, so one, maybe two more questions. Khan asks, I have a SharePoint 2019 on-premises ah. list library to store auto-generated IDs. Mike, are you complaining about another SharePoint question? What is no, that? I was saying Khan. Oh, Khan. Khan. <laughs> Khan. 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 I know, thank you. Uh, the threshold limit is set to 7,000, and it has been exceeded now. So this is a threshold question. Okay. Which is the best way to fix this? Do I increase the limit through central admin? Do Or do I need to do column indexing? Or do I need to create a new list library to store the IDs? Um, Storing auto-generated IDs. So this is this the is, This is an indexing item. issue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, my other question is, you know, are they archiving old things too? So they can kind of clean up things. Right. But, um, that's always my first thing with, when it comes to some of the list views or the threshold stuff, but. It is an indexing thing now. I mean, the, the, the limit is only on the views. It's not the limit on how you can store. You can store millions of records within a list right. or millions of items. So to me, it's just What's an it? indexing issue. Yeah. What's he actually trying to do? Yeah. Or what's I he think they ran. I think they're not indexing, and so they've ran into the limit on the view where it's not able to pop out all that they're expecting. Yeah. Sure. I, so, I think that they index it and they should be fine. It, they can store as many as they want. You're definitely not creating another list. No, sorry, right. you're not. Yeah. No. Replicate a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I would just yeah, I that would be my first thing. Go in and make and make sure it's set to index, and then see if that solves this problem. And create, you know, if that doesn't do it, create special views that pull back fewer items. Um, yeah, I would. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of pushing list view thresholds around, uh, simply because if you eventually go to SharePoint Online, guess what? You're dropping back down to five thousand, the default. Yeah. And that's not going to move. So you yeah. got to get comfortable with uh, big lists and tools to work with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I think it's a good answer. And for our last one, a minute and a half here, but this is only a licensing question, so we can uh, easy. breeze through this one. Oh yeah. yeah, like, yeah, yeah. What are you thinking, it. man? Putting a licensing question in here? You do it. Wait till you hear it, though, Sean. Come on. All right. Sharon asks. I'm hoping somebody can assist me with an issue I'm having, thinking I may have misunderstood the Microsoft pricing plans. That never happens. Yes, she never did. Happens. It's, it's okay. We <laughs> oh, all have. Yes. I'm wanting to use a template in Power Apps called Asset Checkout, which is a model-driven app. I have a Microsoft 365 business standard plan, and each time I go to create an environment, I'm being asked to upgrade my plan. Am I not permitted to set up an environment because I don't have the right level of Microsoft subscription? Yes. Z3 yes. versus Z5. Oh, I mean, Thank I, you I, for I, watching. I, hey, excellent. No. I don't know the specifics, but I can tell you it, it's got to be a licensing issue. It must. Yeah. There must be some connector that that thing needs that yeah. the license she has doesn't do it. I, I wish I could tell you more, but uh, I, I'm sure you're on to the right answer. Finding yeah. out what the problem is, a power app person I'm sure would know right away. Yeah, and, and well, I just ran into a very similar issue. If you actually get an error like that, like she she's being completely driven, then her then she doesn't have the proper license. Doesn't mean her company doesn't have the proper license. It may just not be applied to her. Right? She just doesn't have one yet. You know the, yeah. the default answer to any problem that you run into uh, with SharePoint is uh, like nine out of ten permissions issue. The default answer for Power Apps, in my experience, is licensing. licensing. Yeah. 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 There. But which is a permissions issue. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Eric Harlan user, will right? often argue that everything is permissions. Everything's a permission. Even when it's not. That's right. <laughs> Easier that way. 
That's right. Well, hey, everyone, we are at time. Thank you so much to everybody on the panel. Thanks to all that have watched. Apologize if you any questions that have been asked out in one of the simulcast locations with the video, the technical issues. I turned off the other browsers and so stopped watching those lists. But I know there was at least uh, one or two questions that I'll follow up after after the fact. Uh, the video, of course, will all be available. You'll be able to find it through the AppPoint page uh, out on LinkedIn. And we will be back next week. Again, we're here every Wednesday at, at Wednesday, 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Pacific times. Uh, and so thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see everybody later. Wednesday. Have a lovely evening. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thank you.